Hi, I'm Susan Lloyd. Hi, I'm Keith Goatslant, and welcome to All Things LGBTQ. We are taping on Monday, July 8th. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. So, so you're still here. I, I heard I, you might have slept I underneath that. under the desk for a couple weeks now, yeah. So on our last, yeah, <laughs> on our last, and you've held up well. Thank you, just, thank you. On our last show, yes. we reported that Gail Marlene Schwartz, who we is did. a Vermonter, yes. won the National Indie Excellence Award for her LGBTQ plus book. And oh my, this weekend on the interview show, Linda might have been interviewing Gail Marlene Schwartz in what was probably her first interview after winning the award. Very cool. On that same show, however, mm -hmm. you know, might be the candidate who statewide running for the Senate has raised more money than any other Senate candidate with the exception of one and they may have raised more money than the three incumbents that they're running against. Mm. So you may want to watch Stuart Ledbetter mm. and find out what the buzz is all about. Yeah. And, and with that, I understand what? you're taking me to far and distant places. <laughs> We're going to travel far and wide, bum you out, uh, and then come back and have some fun domestic news. That's the goal. It's, it's a good uh, thing my passport is ready. That's good. That is good. Uh, we're going to start with the Aruban Parliament rejects a bill to open up same-sex marriage. There were 10 votes in favor and 10 votes against the bill to open up to same-sex couples was rejected within five minutes. And there was a whole bruja, as you might imagine, some of the clerics declared a victory for Aruba, saying they've been able to preserve the marriage in its original state and guarantee family and education. I don't know how those are related, personally. Uh, the independent parliamentarian says he voted against it from a Christian view of society and marriage. It doesn't mean we shouldn't take into account the dignity of every person or the legal system, but we need to regulate, and this should have been settled a long time ago. I was going to say, as Anne keeps reporting, the Caribbean and Associated Islands seems to be having a lot of yeah. problems and now, dealing with same-sex marriage. And now it's being uh, pushed to the Supreme Court. Again. Again. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it remains unfortunate that we have to wait for the outcome to see if the people are justified. Cuba, this is a little more upbeat. Cuba's first transgender athlete shows the progress and challenges being faced by LGBTQ people. Eli Malik Ray stepped onto the cordless platform and began delivering powerful punches and spectacular flying kicks against his combatant. He lost the fight, but he won a major victory by becoming the first transgender athlete to officially compete in a Cuban sports league. Interesting, Very good. Right? 26 year old transgender man competed for the first time in the 132 to 143 pound category of Sanda, which is a demanding contact sport that blends martial arts like kung fu with kickboxing. That's going to be hard, regardless of your gender. <laughs> That's just ouch, yeah. exactly. Um, he had to overcome a lot of challenges, including the lack of medications a law that sets conditions to change his gender on his ID and the suspicious looks he gets from people on the street. Educating society doesn't happen in two days, he said. No. It's been four years since he first consulted with a psychologist. He had to get a special card to purchase medications at pharmacies, enabling him to get hormones. And then as, I, I didn't realize this, but it says as Cuba's economic crisis deepened, medications became scarce. Yeah. And he had to rely on other people who brought testosterone from abroad. And while it wasn't illegal for him, it was really challenging and I'm guessing extremely expensive. Well, it's almost like black market time, right? Exactly. Well, th think of the, the difficulties we've had here in the US with the availability of certain medications. In Cuba, he is probably part of a very select group. They're not going to be a priority. Right. 
what is going to be the incentive for anyone to ensure that there's adequate medication available. And then listen to this, he was able to change his name on his ID, but his ID card still displays an F for female because Cuba's current law requires full genital reassignment surgery for them to change. You're right. That's couldn't and, we say and, that the, the F stands for false? Yeah, I, and he, he doesn't want to do that, you know, like he just, so that's, that's really challenging. Um, let's see. While his ID identifies him as female, sports authorities have accepted his male status based on his hormone treatments, medical reports, and self-identification. This has allowed him to compete in the male category of human fighter, Cuban fighters. Interesting. Uh, okay, let's see, where are we going next? Toronto. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, pride protesting uh, mm -hmm. in this week's edition. But so it says thousands sing, dance, and celebrate at Pride Parade until protesters strand marchers and floats mid route. We'll talk about what happened in the US in the, in the next round. But thousands of people were celebrating, but the procession was stopped mid route and canceled by a protest. 30 demonstrators, calling themselves the Coalition Against Pinkwashing, held banners and chanted on Young Street three and a half hours after the parade start. Floats and marchers making their way south to the finish line were stranded behind the protesters who chanted Free Palestine, and Pride is a protest. 45 minutes after the protest began, Pride Toronto announced the remainder of the parade was canceled. Yeah, yeah. We made the decision to cancel out of a commitment to ensuring public safety. We deeply respect and uphold everyone's right to peacefully protest. Our foremost priority is the well-being of all participants. And that's us. That's us. Well, I was going to say, what I appreciated for the July 3rd parade here in Montpelier is it would be the same organizing that was happening, rather that they chose to become part of the parade. Yeah, they were in it instead of obstructing it. And <laughs> their very contingency was, was huge. We were behind them. They encroached they, upon us. We were they, encircled. It, it, it was impressive. And, and I appreciated that it was both the Palestinians living yeah. in Vermont in conjunction with the, the yeah. Jewish community yes. for peace yeah. jointly Together. saying. Together, that was interesting. We need, yeah. It was really interesting. I, what I was truly funny is we were. It encircled by them and several people looked at us in our knights in medieval costumes and said, how is that a reflection of the Palestinian conflict? And we said, it's not. We're, 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 just, we're just our own little We're the group. fun time. We're just the fun people. Yeah. Um, what else? So this, I thought, was sort of endearing. I liked this. A US officiant marries 10 same-sex couples in Hong Kong via video chat. Yes. Uh, ten same-sex couples got married in the U.S. over the Internet. You can do anything, Keith, over the Internet. Uh, uh, apparently, yes. <laughs> in a semi-autonomous southern Chinese city that doesn't formally recognize such unions but offers them legal protections. So this was time, time to mark pride. So this is really interesting. The Most states require couples to appear in person to fill out paperwork. Right and present identification, but Utah does not. Utah, of all places. Mm, and its yeah. digital application process made it a go for online weddings since the COVID-19 crisis. So family members gathered in a hotel wedding hall in Hong Kong's Kowloon Loon district as couples exchanged rings and raised their glasses in a toast. I hope one day that everybody will accept the fact that love is not just between a man and a woman, it's between two people who love each other. It's just two humans who love each other. That's the key. That's the important part. And to be able to publicly declare our love for each other today is a very important step for us, definitely. I'm hoping to show a picture because it was so sweet. I was say, Ten it, couples. Anne has reported frequently on other co countries that they will not recognize unions that occur within their country, but if they happen someplace else, mm -hmm they will then recognize them and give the couple full benefits. Yep. So this seems to be the way around Well, it, it says Hong Kong does not currently allow same-sex marriage, although last year its court of final appeal ruled that the local government should offer some form of relationship recognition to same-sex couples within two years, and that deadline's coming up in September. Does not 
yet a way to go to a marriage registry to get married, but there's still this way we can offer them to realize their dreams of getting married. Oh. All right. All right, and then we have kind of around, around Europe and Asia, Latvia. Civil unions took effect Monday. Okay, get out your passport. We're going to Latvia. But it's not uh, marriage, it's civil unions. Civil unions yeah. came into effect Monday, and the first queer couples have already registered their unions in the Baltic nation. Uh, one of the folks interviewed said, I feel excited, kind of emotional about it as well, because it's a really big step, not only for us, but for our country itself. And being first, it's all the publicity that comes with it as well. It's it's kind of a bit stressful, but at the same time, I feel happy that we can finally do it. They, Latvia amended its constitution to ban same-sex marriage in 2005, but in 2020, the Constitutional Court ruled that the state must give same-sex couples the same benefits that straight married couples have. Sounds a little bit like the progression we went yep. through here, right? Uh, the, of course, the bill was bitterly opposed, and our, our friend, <laughs> Sarcastically, she said, Poland, ah. <laughs> still holding out. <laughs> Shocking. Uh, they have finally agreed to pass a civil union bill, albeit one that has been watered down significantly. The resulting bill will not allow any adoption rights. A common surname will be conducted by notaries without a ceremony. Oh, jeez. The government hopes to bring the bill forward. And it says the, they're in part doing this because they, they continue to be excluded from the, the EU. European. And until they meet this minimum threshold, they're not going to get in. I think they have a ways to go before that. Uh, let's see. France, the National Rally, has a long history of campaigning against LGBTQ rights, but has not made that central to its program in, in this election, where it is focused on pocketbook issues and rejection of immigration. They've long opposed same-sex marriage, and its current leader has campaigned and voted against allowing lesbians to access IVF and supports a bill to ban gender care for minors. Boo. They allegedly attacked a gay teenager in Paris after the results of last month's parliament elections were announced, and they were shown to win the largest number of seats. They were reported to have shouted, you'll see when Bardella is in power and Hitler comes back. Ugh. OK. The attackers were arrested. Georgia, a package of extreme anti-LGBTQ bills sailed through its first reading in the Georgian parliament on a 78 to 0 vote. That doesn't bode well, Keith. I, well, Georgia in Europe, Georgia in the South, Russia. they seem to have a lot in common. Exactly. The bills ban recognition of same-sex relationships, forbid recognition of gender other than birth sex, forbid medical treatment for gender change, and criminalize any advocacy for LGBTQ rights. The government says it hopes to pass the legislation by the fall, ahead of national elections in October. Ugh. India, the High Court of India's Kerala state, upheld the right of LGBTQ people to live autonomously as it rejected a petition from the parents of a 23-year-old who sought to have their daughter committed to a mental institution to treat her sexual orientation. Yeah, we saw before Stonewall. The yeah. young we woman fled her family and was living with her partner, a transgender man. Her family members repeatedly attempted to violently abduct her from her home. I thought my family was dysfunctional. <laughs> That's... The court ruled that the woman has the right to live her life on her own terms and that sexual orientation is an innate part of a person's identity. The court also directed the parents to hand over all of their daughter's personal documents, which they'd been withholding. That is scary. Mm -hmm. Same-sex relationships are not illegal in India, although last year the Indian Supreme Court ruled that the government does not have to recognize same-sex marriage, leaving that question to parliament. And one more. I thought this was interesting. Cameroon. Did you hear about this? The president's daughter came out as a lesbian. Yes. Brenda, daughter of Cameroon President Paul Bia, has revealed she's in a same-sex relationship with a Brazilian model. This revelation is particularly striking given Cameroon's strict law criminalizing same-sex relationships with penalties of up to five years in prison. He's one of the Africa's longest serving leaders since eight, 1982 and has been vocal against gay rights, which intensifies the impact of, his, of Brenda's public display. There was a caption on her Instagram account that expressed her deep affection. She said, I'm crazy about you and I want the world to know. 
<clears throat> this is crazy. Not... Our former professions. Yeah. Yeah. She's a rapper. And acknowledging her father's long-standing policies criminalizing homosexuality and same-sex activities, the president's daughter expressed optimism for future change in Cameroon. Nobody will have anything to say because only love shall win. Uh, That's nice. That's sweet. Yeah. Well, I'll put, on that note, I'll push it over to you. Over to you. And this week's trivia question, and I... Totally bum Susan out with it. <laughs> what else is new with you, Keith? Yeah. 40 years ago, on the 7th of July, there was an incident so violent and senseless that it shocked our region. What was it? So, and, and there's a lot that was happening this past weekend commemorating and acknowledging what had happened. So, mm. so looking at events, Rainbow Umbrella, still in there, women's discussion group, which is in person now, and the book discussion group. Now, book discussion, are you meeting in person or is it still on Zoom? Zoom. OK. So if you're interested, look at the Facebook page for either. They'd like to hear what you have to say. So we've already started promoting this. On Saturday, August 17th, the Queer Arts Festival is coming back to the Plainfield Rec Field. And from talking with the organizers, they have already had more vendors applying than they had slots for. Wow. For snacks, yes, there will be food trucks. <laughs> you remembered. I asked there. that last time. Will there be snacks? And I checked on it. <laughs> And there will be performances that are happening throughout the day. Nice. So it's not just you know people with crafts, art, whatever. It is a festival event, truly. Mm -hmm. So, and talking with the organizers, volunteers, to pull this off, they need volunteers, and we will make sure the contact information is displayed. So, if you're interested, August seventeenth. They'd like you to be there. Another plug, Pride Center, their health and wellness survey. It's online, and we'll put the contact up again. And from having done it, it truly only takes 10 to 15 minutes. It's not this, oh, I have to think about it to answer kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And they truly do review the results they get to inform what are the programs, what is the direction that the Pride Center is going in. And it is open until September 15th. So if you're watching this on Saturday night, the 13th, put on your best summer outfit. <laughs> Come to Hubbard Park. Flouncy hat. Big fl flouncy hat. You know, floral display would mm -hmm. be lovely. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. 1 o'clock, Hubbard Park. It might be a potluck picnic for <laughs> it may be a bring your favorite food dish pit, pit, or whatever mm. who am I to stifle Susan's creativity <laughs> this may be a sort of meet and greet get together lots let's talk about the Vermont Democratic Party's Ooh. new queer caucus Ooh. and Michael P. Check nice. will be one of the people who has been asked to speak Thomas Renner, who we have interviewed in all things, who is the Democratic candidate for lieutenant governor, mm -hmm. and Brenda Churchill. Oh, nice. So 1 o'clock, Hubbard Park. If you identify as queer and Democrat, they, they'd like to see you. Lost Nation Theater. Mm. It's time to dance. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Starting on July 18th and running through August 4th, and performances are Friday and Saturday at 7.30, Sunday afternoon, 2 p.m., for those of us who can't stay up too late. <laughs> this may be their production of The Prom. I know people that are in that. Well, the, the stage yeah, manager go. may be our friend Maybe. Kim Ward. But yes. So, and what it says is, down on their luck, Broadway stars shake up a small Indiana town as they rally behind a teen 
who just wants to go to the prom with her girlfriend. Yes. And Lost Nation says, you know, just like their production of Hairspray back in 2016, our director's and designer's ingenuity will make this big show fit into their little theater. <laughs> yeah. One thing to keep in mind, though, is one of the things that didn't survive the flood is the elevator, elevator. in yep. City Hall. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to climb you have upstairs. to be able to go. I, I want to say Kim said it was at least thirty seven steps, it's and it's like two flights, it's a couple different levels, yeah, of stairs. Mm -hmm. So please keep that in mind. And because of the royalties involved with this, because this is a fairly recent oh, yeah. Broadway production, mm -hmm. they can't do streaming. Mm. It's one of the things that's it's not an option the rights, for them. Yeah, that makes so. Sense. But Lost Nation said, if this is something you would truly like to attend, please get in touch with them. Let's see what might be possible. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. with I saw it on Broadway. You, okay. I, Anne and Linda did. I didn't realize yeah. that you had yeah. as well. Okay. Yeah, and my friend Josh was in it at um, the Flynn. Ah! So I've seen it a couple times. All yeah, right. It's a good show. Good message. So, Great message. And you can get tickets online. Yeah. So book your ticket now, because don't you want to see it a third time? I mean, yes, because Tara Noel is in it. She was our choreographer for Spamalot, Aww. and she's amazingly talented. See All her. right. Okay, back to me? Yep. All right. Um, do I get half the time, or are you just going to th throw something at me? Okay. <laughs> uh, I've never thrown things You at just me. threaten. I, Biden I do this. Officials, I do this. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Biden officials are pu yeah. push. There, these are, there are a bunch of stories. I'm going to yeah. read you some snippets, and then I would love to hear your, your commentary, Keith. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Biden officials are being pushed to remove age limits for trans surgery. That's one piece. And then there's a secondary piece about they're saying that they now, the White House is saying, allegedly, that they oppose gender-affirming surgery. And then there's people getting mad at the White House for that, and it's all, it's all a mess. But so... Uh, newly released emails from an influential group issuing transgender medical guidelines indicate that U.S. health officials lobbied to remove age minimums for surgery because of concerns over political fallout. Health officials in the Biden administration pressed an international group of medical experts to remove age limits for adolescent surgeries according to newly unsealed court documents. Age minimum age minimums officials feared could fuel growing political opposition to such treatments. There is a whole thing about this group. Um, what does the acronym stand for, Keith? W-P-A-T-H. It's a medical, it's a group for medical professionals. They published recommendations. They removed minimum ages to reflect that a one-size-fit-all healthcare model is not accurate or appropriate for every individual person. And they were worried that if they listed ages, there would be further limitations to care by creating or reinforcing arbitrary mm -hmm. boundaries to care or ignoring other possible contributing health factors. So some of, some of the backstory before you go yeah. on is the American Pediatric Academy mm -hmm. does not fully endorse and support surgical intervention for transgender youth mm -hmm. because their approach is there is so much that needs to be taken into consideration. This is probably a decision that should happen later versus sooner. And therein lies the issue mm -hmm. because e even now when there are minimal restrictions, there is a very small number of youth who have had any type of surgical intervention or treatment. And most of that has been what is referred to as top surgery, mm -hmm. um, either to masculize or demasculize. Mm -hmm. So there really isn't an issue. And the White House press corps, when they were making their statement should have taken more time looking at their language. But a lot of this is being blown up by our opposition, mm. which is why the concern from the, from the physicians group saying, if we put a late, 
age limit any place within this, which is why there should be no age restriction. It's a best practice issue that our opposition will then step in and try and make it lower, 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 so that what our opposition is trying to do is create a lot of dust, mm -hmm. saying, oh, look, the Biden administration doesn't support you to try and create yet another riff with a marginalized community, which are going to, our votes are going to be crucial during the next election. So mm -hmm. it's going to take time to tease out with fact mm -hmm. versus rhetoric. Yep. And it's one of those that we really don't talk a lot about what is truly involved in gender affirmation procedures mm -hmm. and how are those decisions made? And it's a conversation we need to have more of. Yep. So. Thank you. And I'm handing it back to you now. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, we talked last time about um, how President Biden had pardoned folks that had served in the military. And so now, of course, as, as, as you start to think about the actual implementation of this, it's, it's quite complicated. So though he announced that troops that were convicted under the old policy would get an honorable, will be honorably discharged uh, and that they would review people's benefits. So there's thousands of people that will be impacted by this yep. because this costs people years of benefits and home loans and educational benefits and medical care. And it's not clear whether the government will try to find a way to compensate for those or how it's going to deal with that going forward. And I remember last time, the Pentagon was balking at it. Yep. And uh, so one of the folks that was interviewed said, like, this is great, you know, but technically to do this, the burden is on the service member to come forth with all this documentation and to, and to apply for eligibility. And if you were in a, a power, if, if there was a power differential, if you were of a higher rank and you had consensual sex, you don't get it. And if you were cheating with somebody who is married, you don't get, there's all these, you know, uh, criteria that you have to meet. And as it says, as I was reading this, I was surprised by this, it doesn't take away the cause of discharge. There's just a note that it's been changed. Like, so it doesn't, it's not um, redacted. What's the word? Yeah, redacted. No, when you, like if you have a claim against you, I'm thinking about like uh, mandated reporter stuff. When you purged, it's not yeah. removed from your permanent rec or whatever. Um, but of course, these have life-altering repercussions because they didn't have access to benefits. And, you know, it helps you in attaining jobs, all those other things, right? So it's still don't know what's going to happen for back pay or restitution or if any of this will be retroactive. Well, it's interesting to, to hear you report on it because part of the original suit by the former service members is how laborious the process was and the onus that was being put on them to prove that what the government had done was wrong versus the government being able to justify their action. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like that hasn't been resolved. No. Uh, okay. Jill and Ashley Biden headlining a White House Pride celebration. That was fun. Um, there, was, there, was, there were protesters that interrupted that as well. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but uh, people were, were chanting no pride and genocide, but that was drowned out by four more years. Okay. Yeah. Uh, last time I was telling you about the Netflix documentary, Outstanding, with the... Yeah, I watched Chinese. it. Did you? Yeah, Wasn't it good? I loved it. Wasn't it great? I loved it. So I, and I was trying, and I was saying to you last time, there was a woman and she had her own show and it was like Sonny and Jenner. Well, now there's an article about her, Robin Tyler. Yep. Uh, and so the, the article is saying that they're so happy that she's finally been brought into the light. She had a TV show and made yep. a comment. Um, I think at one point in time, she Robin made a Tyler comment came about, to Vermont. Really? But, yeah. She made a comment about Anita Bryant and her show was canceled the yep. next day. That's the power of the orange juice lady. Scary. Uh, she was. She and her partner uh, were on the show together. But she uh, is. She also organized the first three national marches on Washington, including 1987's mock wedding of hundreds of queer couples. Mm -hmm. She and her future wife were the first couple to sue the state of California, leading to the seven-year legal battle that culminated in marriage equality. 
if you are in a same-sex marriage in the U.S., you have her to thank. Interesting. Uh, okay, so now talking about the protests in our country that were uh, marred pride. And I'd love, Anne and Linda, I want to hear what your experience was. So they, there were pro-Palestinian protesters blocked pride marches in several cities, including Boston, Philadelphia, and Denver. Uh, people were waving red, white, green, and black. Hundreds of pro-Palestinian activists disrupted some of the nation's largest pride parades. Um, let's see, in Philadelphia, they temporarily blocked the city's June 2nd march. In Boston, hostile clashes with police broke out during the city's annual parade on June 8th, leading to the arrest of three protesters. And in Denver, dozens of pro protesters bypassed SWAT teams to make their way onto the street. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, and in New York, the country's, of course, we know the f country's first pride marches were held on June 28, 1970, the uprising in, uh, you know, to honor Stonewall. Pride goes way back to the words of Marsha P. Johnson, one of the veterans of Stonewall, that said, there's no pride for some without liberation for all. Let's see what else we got. Uh, instances of anti-LGBTQ vandalism. This remember we were talking about the Harwood, mm -hmm. the Harwood flag last time. Two dozen states experienced um, pride decorations being stolen, thieves taking rainbow flags, and sixty flags in Boise, Idaho, were taken down four times. That's a lot. ABC, NBC News found that pride flags, rainbow crosswalks, and other LGBTQ symbols were stolen or vandalized in more than yep. 40 cities across the country. Um, two dozen states, Northeast, Midwest, West Coast, and South. Even liberal enclaves like New York City couldn't catch a break. At the Stonewall National Monument, the site of the 1969 uprising, Pride flags were ripped down and thrown to the ground twice this month, second year in a row. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, the, one of the men in Boise, Idaho, said that uh, he believes that with volunteers showing up and allies showing up to continue to put up the flags every time they're taken down, it really makes you feel like people, you know, like we're, the good guys are going to win in the end, that even allies are coming forth and putting up the flags. Tractor Supply, did you hear about this, Keith? Yes. What the heck? They put out a... I will, I will just drive past it as I'm also driving past Hobby Lobby and not stopping. Yeah, I, I, I feel the same way. I feel like put out the call to, to boycott these places. Absolutely. Uh, they've focused on selling, uh, you know, farm and rural agricultural type equipment. They, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it made me want to throw up a little in my mouth, but just some of the highlights. They put out this statement that... We're passionate about being good neighbors in our hometowns because without you, we would not be what we are. We've invested millions of dollars in veteran causes, emergency response, animal shelters, state fairs, rodeos, and farmer's market. So they go on to say, we've heard from our customers that we've disappointed them. And going forward, we'll ensure our activities are, and giving tie directly to our business. This means we will no longer submit data to the human rights campaign. We will eliminate all DEI roles and retire our current DEI goals while still ensuring a respectful environment. Excuse me? Good luck with that. All righty. And we will withdraw our carbon emission goals and focus on land and water conservation. Ex what? That seems, because cli climate is... Does that sound contradictory to it's, you? It's merely a theory, and it's a queer theory. Oh, right. Yeah, I forgot are. about that. There we are. We are always here and ready to serve you and your family, unless it's a queer family. There you go. With our legendary service. Texas Supreme Court upholds ban on gender-affirming care for trans youth, one of 25 states that have adopted laws restricting or banning gender-affirming medical care. Boo. Um, advocates have criticized the ruling. It's impossible to overstate the devastating impact of this ruling on Texas transgender youth and families that love and support them. I, I don't get this. They also, Texas, Supreme Court sides with a Christian judge who refuses to officiate gay weddings. That's like the cake thing, right? Mm -hmm. This woman is a justice of the peace and refuses to marry same-sex mm -hmm. couples. And 
her defense is that she refers them to somebody down the road. <laughs> like, so she just like, rather than, rather than, you know, assertively saying I'm a raging homophobe, she just says, why don't you call my friend down the road? And that's her defense is that, you know, it's, it's her religious objection. But I'm giving you an option. I'm giving you an option. Yeah. Exactly. That's what she said. And the first Liberty Institute hailed this as a victory for religious oh, liberty. Of course they did. Uh, and then there was a story about these LGBTQ uh, rights lawyers went judge shopping. Alabama, <laughs> a federal judge in Alabama described this uh, maneuvering by lawyers from LGBTQ and civil rights organizations who face potential sanctions for judge shopping in a case over gender affirming treatment. They basically drew the short straw and got a judge who is a Trump appointee known to be, you know, particularly <laughs> voracious in there. And uh, I don't know, I think they tried to delay the case and gather more information and now they're being <laughs> sanctioned for <laughs> Oh well. Uh, let's see, we talked a little bit about the New York City Pride disruption, uh, but so maybe we'll, but so anyway, there was a commotion that broke out on Christopher Street, which yep. is sad, right in the heart of yeah. everything, a block away from Stonewall, when several activists protesting the war in Gaza sat down in front of the human rights campaign float blocking its path. Some of the activists smeared themselves with red paint as they sat over banners about freeing Palestine and handed out leaflets. Many in the crowd joined in their melodious chants of free, free Palestine and shut it down, including some on the HRC float who began to work these words and others into the queer anthems the vehicle was blasting through the narrow street. New York City police, including at least one adorned with rainbow NYPD community patches, came to arrest and zip tie the protesters. The police forced most journalists, including this one, out of the area to prevent clear photography of the arrests. The parade was soon on its way until around 4.30 when Mother Nature had her way, pouring down on the participants in the crowds. People popped open umbrellas and sought shelter under scaffolding. Preliminary estimates indicate 25,000 marchers and 2 million spectators. Holy cow, I used to go to the yeah. San Francisco parade and I thought that was pretty big. Wow. Uh, Anti-Israel demonstrators busted through barricades at the New York City Pride Sunday, so throwing blood at the human rights float. That sounds, sounds intense. Uh, on less oh, scary news, thousands of marchers joined the Reclaim Pride Coalition's Queer Liberation March in Lower Manhattan. I thought that was interesting. Uh, let's see. I want to be mindful of the time. Um, judges' order greatly expands where Biden can't enforce a new rule protecting LGBTQ students. This is Topeka, Kansas, enforcement of a federal rule expanding anti-discrimination protections for LGBTQ students has been blocked in four states. Well, you're going to talk about Maine, right? No. No. And let's see. <laughs> this is just funny because I had to end on a lot. On a lot. Okay. Earlier this week, Donald oh. Trump Jr. Mm, yes, I saw. <laughs> took to social media. You know this already isn't headed anywhere good, Keith. I know. <laughs> and he decided to go after the name Beryl, the hurricane, B-E-R-Y-L. He commented Gee. that the name Beryl is too genderless for a hurricane. I wish I were kidding. Over to you, Keith. I, I saw it, <laughs> and, and really, people. He's, I, he's upset at the naming of a hurricane. He doesn't like the gender implications. That's insane. So having some fun <laughs> here in Vermont, Rainbow Bridge Community Center in Barrie, who is doing phenomenal work, has announced a shift in their leadership. Ooh. Heather Eli has been elected as their new executive director, mm. transitioning from their role as director of operations. Oh. Shauna Trader, who I viewed as the, the person responsible for 
the incredible outreach that they've done to the greater community following the flood last year, mm. is now going to be focusing on her position as program manager for the Rainbow Relief Fund. Oh, nice. Good luck, Shauna. Awesome. Which allows her to center her ongoing and vital work to support the most vulnerable <laughs> members of our community. Some of the recent things going on there, within the next few weeks, they will be launching two new peer-led play center groups for queer kids. Oh. One is for nice. ages 7 to 12, the other 13 to 18. Nice. Our facilitators for these groups are vetted and have the right background to help our young folk feel engaged and supported. There will be updates. They all, I, don't, I don't know why I thought of us, but they recently kicked off their brand new Bad Art Club. <laughs> Same a one. group with, and they had 20 people. Our facilitators provide a simple art project and basic instruction for those who prefer a bit of structure while leaving space for the chaotic fae among us to freely explore. They will be back on the second Thursday of each month from five to eight. Is there a paint and sip I th <laughs> version I think of this? there could be. <laughs> And they've started their pop-up health and wellness with the Ishtar Collective again and the People's Health and Wellness Oh, Clinic. nice. And this is specifically to offer support services to LGBTQIA 2S plus people impacted by the sex trade. And they are specifically looking mm -hmm. to outreach um, to those who have directly experienced exploitation, trafficking, et cetera. How can we help you? And they say that their new Liberation Library is fully open to lending. Hmm. The library contains books focused on queer experience in both nonfiction and fiction, from board books on up, as well as books focusing on healing, resilient community building, creative processing, and more. Nice. You're doing phenomenal work. Thank you. So. Every now and then, <clears throat> you get an indication of how culture in Vermont may have changed and that we might be becoming a bit mainstream. The Washington World reporting on funding available to support Vermont's LGBTQ plus communities through the Samara Fund. And it's not a brief article. Wow. They were in depth. Funding is now available through the Samara Group um, to people and groups throughout Vermont who demonstrate their dedication to the empowerment, health, and safety of LGBTQ plus and HIV positive people. Samara offers four distinct types of grant funding, general organizational support, project-specific support, emergent support for organization unplanned needs, and sponsorship of queer event. Samara also offers scholarship to Vermont LGBTQ plus youth, which is a separate process through the Vermont Student Sixth League, VSAC. Nice. <clears throat> Nonprofits or community groups, so I don't think you have to be a 501c3, mm may apply at any time this summer for up to $5,000. Applications will be expect, accepted through August 27th. Emergent and sponsorship funding is available year long as long as the funding lasts. That's great. So, and also in that same venue. I love, I love that you brought proof. I. <laughs> just looking. We, well, would have, we would have believed you, but I love you know, that you went that extra step to show us well, the this evidence. Well, this is because this is a bill that not only had we been reported on, but some of us may have been actively involved with, and it mm. was S-220. And the narrative in the Burlington Free Press is banning books just got a lot harder in the yes. Green Mountain State. As of July 1st, Vermont public schools and libraries are required to establish clear non-discrimination procedures for challenging and removing books from shelves. Books can no longer be banned or restricted for discussing politics, sexual orientation, gender identity, sexual health, 
race, ethnicity, personal morality, religious views, or disability status. And our legislator said they passed this bill in response to rising incidents of book restrictions nationwide. Um, so far, Vermont is only the third state behind Illinois and California to pass legislation of this caliber that ban regarding book banning. And this was the comment from some of our officials, despite Vermont's status as a low risk state for book bans, challenges and censorship of controversial literature still occur. And they referenced parents against critical theory. This was the comment from Senator Brian Campion, who, by the way, has chosen not to run for re-election. Growing up as a gay kid, I would go to the library and search out books trying to figure things out. And we want kids to be able to go in the same way, in a way that they can sort of feel safe and explore who they are. The law also protects public libraries from criminal theft threatening a right previously afforded only to municipal libraries. Mm. The other piece of Vermont's law <clears throat> is that its schools, both public and private, are held to the same standard. I was going to ask you that, if it was just libraries in town or if it covered the school system libraries. Bingo. Awesome. And also, there is a provision So colleges that, too, universities, anything? Absolutely. And a select board could not move to remove things from a library. It's a public process, and uh, the library has to have wow. language. And as a part of this, if you're a patron of a library age 12 or older, you're the only one who can release the information on your library card. Ooh. No one else gets to look at what it is you're reading other than you. Oh, I love that. So really quickly, there was an incident that occurred in northern Vermont, and it was in um, Derby Line. A house was broken into, vandalized, and racial epithets were spray painted throughout the house. The state police are saying, if anyone can help, please do. And I'm reporting on this because we know hate knows no boundary. You know, racial discrimination, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability status, we're all there together. Mm -hmm. And if there's something being focused in one area, it easily can spread out. Mm -hmm. So Linda, you're in Boston. You should wander over to the former Rogers Middle School because they just opened the Pride House. Oh, I read about that. Today marks a momental, monumental step forward for inclusion and diversity in Boston. The grand opening of the city's first LGBTQ affirming affordable senior housing community fulfills a critical need for our most vulnerable older adults. But wait, we don't, they don't get to move. You don't get to move, Linda. <laughs> The pride Just is need to go visit. Go come, over and check it out. And then come back. Mixed income, studio mm. one, two bedroom apartments available to households earning less than 30% to less than 100% of the area media income, which is $36,000 to $103,000. Hmm. Residents will have access to robust on-site amenities, including lounges, oh. sunroom, large event and gallery spaces, classrooms, fitness center, oh. on-site laundry, outdoor courtyard, and more. Ooh. We're there. And field so trip, field trip. And Associated Senator Edward Markey, who is from Massachusetts and a member of the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, introduced last week the Elder Pride Act, legislation to support LGBTQI plus older adults and older adults living with HIV. The legislation would establish an Office of LGBTQI Inclusion 
within the Department of Health and Human Services to advocate, coordinate activities, recommend policies, and collect data on LGBTQI plus <clears throat> older Vermonters. The bill would also establish a rural grant program to serve the unique needs of your rural older Vermont adults, including through education and training, community outreach, and creation of community spaces and improved cultural competency. Nice. <clears throat> but they didn't do all good things in our Congress, in the House, remember this is Republican controlled, their subcommittee on labor, health, and human services, education, and related agencies have gutted the HIV, HIV appropriations bill. <laughs> they would eliminate $2.14 million from the US Centers for Disease Control's HIV prevention programs they're going to take away $190 million from the Ryan White HIV AIDS program, $15 million from the Department of Health and Human Services Minority HIV program. And they say they're doing it in response to the liberal agenda of the current administration. But, and, and this is where it's, this election is so critical. The bill also includes provisions known as policy riders, something just attached to but not necessarily related, mm -hmm. that would take away rights and protections from women, such as access to birth control and abortion, and for minorities, including LGBTQ plus people. They can't do a direct abortion ban, so they're going to try and sneak it into mm. everything else that they can find. Mm. There's been a lot of conversation about <clears throat> if Joe Biden should run for mm, yes. president again. Yeah. They did a sort of little poll to say, OK, if it's not Joe Biden, who has the best chance? Mm. Do you know who came out on top? Mm -mm. Might have been Pete Buttigieg. Oh, I did read something about that, but then there was a, an article that said he'd be better as vice president. No, no, no. Because it, he didn't have the, you know, the... No, no, no. Th that came within from within the Democratic machine. Uh, they said, oh, maybe he oh, would be... The, maybe it would be better served if he were Kamala Harris's mm, vice, vice presidential, president. because then you would shore up mm -hmm. that disenfranchised mm -hmm. disenfranchise minority vote mm -hmm. that they're so concerned about. Mm -hmm. And it's a generational thing as well, right? Exactly. Well, and there were the trans bills that were happening in New Hampshire, and I had questions about, well, what's taking so long to figure out what's yeah. going on? What I have learned is that their legislative council is still putting it into the final law version hmm. to be sent to the governor's desk. Hmm. That hasn't happened yet. Once the governor gets it, he had, there are five days in which he needs to act. Right. He either needs to sign it, veto it, or he does nothing and it, they all become law without signature, which is mm -hmm. something we're used to here in Vermont. Mm -hmm. But on a positive trans note, yes, please. Nikki Hiltz <laughs> qualified for the US Olympic team after they ran record time in the women's 1500 meter race. Nikki Hiltz is transgender and identifies as non-binary. I, I read that. And they were in fourth place until like the last couple hundred yards and then just sprinted ahead. And as they were being interviewed afterwards, they gave a great deal of credit for the advancement in women's athletics and in this event to Ellie St. Pierre, who may be a Vermonter, who had set the standard 
and up until Nikki made their final push, Ellie was the person in the lead. So, Interesting. So they and did beat, that mean they qualified to go to the Olympics? They are now part of the yeah. Olympic team, and they will be going to the Olympics representing the U.S., and this is not going to be an uplifting and the answer to the trivia question. 40 years ago, July 7th, 1984, Charlie Howard and his boyfriend, Roe Ogden, were walking down the street. This was in Bangor, Maine. Three teenagers, age 16, 15, and 17, chased them yelling homophobic epitaphs until they caught Charlie and threw him over the State Street Bridge into the Kenedusky stream, despite Charlie's pleas that he could not swim. Charlie drowned. Roy escaped and pulled a fire alarm. Charlie's body was found by rescue workers hours later. This event galvanized not only the Bangor, but the Maine community. It's when our allies stepped forward and started giving voice to, we did not deserve how we were being treated. It's very similar to what had occurred with Matthew Shepard on a national level, but this did not gain the same notoriety that Matthew had. Years later, as an adult, one of the teenage assailants toured Maine talking about his involvement in the murder and the damage that intolerance can do to people and their community. His story was published as a book, Penitence, A True Story, from which he received no royalties. He gained nothing from telling his narrative, but People learned from it. So, and since then, in Maine, they commemorate July 7th, and there was a huge observance this week. And the city of, Maine, of Bangor <clears throat> has created an ongoing monument to what happened to Charlie and that we deserve acceptance and inclusion. So... Hmm. Knowing that we're not finished and it's not over, we must remember to resist. resist.